big deep breath, everybody, because we're going to change the tone somewhat. New Zealand rugby's move to sell 12.5% of its future income to the US fund manager Silver Lake remains at a very messy impasse after things turned, well, frankly, a bit feral over the weekend. The Players Association told media before it told New Zealand rugby about its alternative option of selling a 5% share through a stock exchange listing. That saw NZR boss Mark Robinson react pretty angrily. He was shocked and disappointed that the NZRPA was trying to effectively destroy the Silver Lake deal. They wheeled out some big guns too. Richie McCaw, who is great mates with the Players Association boss Rob Nicholl has broken his silence. He says he wants to see reasoned debate about the two options. And Conrad Smith, who works for the International Players Association, also backed his old skipper's call for greater debate around the two options. But it seems very personal at the top from what the public insults. And there seems to be a very significant standoff between Rob Nicholl, who is with the Players Association, of course, and the chairman of New Zealand Rugby, Brent Impey. So the question is, if they're going to head back to media Will anything actually be resolved by some of these key protagonists? Do they either need to back down or step aside. And that's the I'm lobbing question. that in, and I'm you're lobbing out. it in. You're throwing in the <laughs> grenade and going. And that's because the question. It's right? one of the things. I'm sure we'd like to be talking about something different. Uh, like to be talking about progress and things that aren't necessarily. I suppose maybe having a imp negative impact on the game. Talking about this conversation. Han, how important is it these two parties? They find a way to get together in the boardroom again, and maybe sooner rather than later. Yeah, essential that they do that. I suppose the thing to remember, this is certainly not the first disagreement that the Players Association and the NZR have had before. I suppose the difference is just how publicly it's being played out at the moment. Um, but we can't get away from the fact that the players and those that represent them are major stakeholders in this deal. Um, and they will be now as their players and, and in the future as coaches and board members and club captains. So we do need to find a way to get them around the table and maybe it's just with different people than we've currently got. And that's the conversation you've had for a while, JK, on the show, is the fact about there seems to be, there seems to be just at the moment, the, the players, the major players, in, terms, in regards to individuals, they can't seem to get across the line and get past that. But there has been more information come out tonight in regards to this relationship. Yes, I think the, where I'm disappointed is that both sent out their Trojan horses. One, you know, players talking about values and losing the values and selling the game out. Um, when we should be keeping into New Zealand. Um, NZR probably not telling us the strategy around what they're going to do with the money. Tonight there's been a letter that's just been made public to, to the chairman of Forsyth Bar, which is David Kirk and the cha chairman of the NZRPA. So I'm disappointed the players didn't control Rob Nicol and he leaked it directly to the media because I think if we're going to talk about values, one of ours is in the stomach and not in the back. So that's how bad the relationship is. On the other side, I think the New Zealand Rugby Union um, have been talking about what we're going to do with the money and I think we need to be really transparent with the public now, exactly. I, I've asked a couple of questions directly because um, I've been asking around in the money, in the equity side, because people say to me, oh, if you sell your equity, you're never going to get it back. I ask this directly. What assurances can we have about this 12.5% not being sold off after 10 years. And I said, first rights to buy back are ours, right? So that's one of the answers. If it goes well, and when they say going well, it means that they want to take the 180 million that we earn per annum now to 400 and 450, which means that if they do go to sell it, we might be able to buy a percentage of it back, possibly not the whole lot. And the third thing is they have very tight control on who it gets sold to at the end of the Silver Lakes deal. So I got some answers around that. The other thing that I'm cu curious about is that it seems by this letter, and everyone can go and read it now that it's public, is that some of the stuff that we're talking about, the IPO, was shared with the, the NZRPA pre the steering group then deciding between Silver Lakes, CIVA, CSC, and that. So the trouble is that no one's going to win. No one's going to win this argument. We're just looking like fools around the world, right? So if you're Silver Lakes, why haven't you walked away? And, and it looks like they've said, we'll give you a chance to look at some other options. So someone has to get out of the negotiating room. And it sounds like it should be Rob Nicholl and possibly the current chairman of the NZR, Brent Timpey, because it looks like they're clashing. Because it's not working. And we are just going through a whole lot of pain. So that's... 
That's upsetting me, and I get really upset about it and passionate about it, as you know. This is not good for our game, and it is a critical time in our game. This is a turning point in our game. And this is where, Mills, uh, obviously high-profile former All Blacks have come out. Uh, Richie McCourt, who is obviously a good friend of Rob McNichol. Uh, Conrad Smith, though, learned um, a lawyer who's, who, who came out on the weekend talking about the, it is time for this balanced discussion. But the reality is, is it going to be able to happen with this group of players? And I think we need to understand... I think New Zealand Rugby are looking at a couple of things significantly. Their ability to generate greater revenue offshore, but also to protect the grassroots gain. This proposed option from the players doesn't necessarily deliver the same things that New Zealand Rugby are trying to. It doesn't tick all of those boxes. And is that where at the moment there is, a, it seems to be, I suppose, the difference of opinion? Uh, possibly could well be, and I, and I think, you know, it's good to know that they have got options, that there is an option. They're not just saying, don't go down Silver Lake. Well, here's another possibility that we can actually sit around the table and discuss. I think the biggest, the biggest thing is, it comes out of this, regardless of, I know what you mean, JK, that we're looking like a little bit disjointed. Well, really disjointed is that both sides care about what's going to happen in, in terms of New Zealand rugby and the whole game in itself. Now, when you get players coming out and this and this and that, I think what they've created is an actual little wee, you know, little wee, segments where you know they're fighting about this little thing they're fighting about this little thing and that's where i sit because we don't actually have that information i'll be really interested that's the first time i've heard that tonight about you know what the answers that you've got where you got we who, who's who's actually confirmed that because i mean we, we sit around here every week and we go well what's actually happened and then someone you know gives you a call and then the following week's a different story and i think that's where they've got to come back. Isn't this what the two weeks was for after the mediation to go away and actually really just come back together by themselves, regardless? And I think you're right. I think it needs those, the two guys that are actually coming out needs to, need to step away and actually discuss what needs to happen and try and, and, and work it out in that way. Silver Lake aren't going away. They're not silly. Because they know, they know what, the, what, this, what this investment is, you know, the tradition that comes, that comes with it, which is perhaps why they haven't gone. So we're fortunate enough that they're still around. But they really need to try and, and do this, you know, outside of the public arena. Well, New Zealand Rugby Hand are trying to invest in so many different levels. There are so many different parts to their organisation. The fact that they are trying to grow the game, they're trying to grow the, the, the role of the women's game in New Zealand, which is showing great growth. And you look at this, to me, what's important to you? And how do you feel a little bit about the fact that it is, you're a former Blackfern, how do you feel about this being played out in the media rather than behind closed doors with people trying to find a solution? Yeah, it doesn't sit that well, does it? Um, doesn't sit with, well with me. <laughs> no, nor JK, right? So, and you're right, the, and the difference, I suppose, between what Silver Lake typically invests in is that this is, an, is a national, national teams and a community rugby and women's rugby. It's a bigger picture than just a professional body, which is a little bit easier to control and control the message. Um, the, the fact that they're willing to have a look at all of those areas is really encouraging. Emotions are high, though, at the moment, JK. How do we temper that? I mean, the fact, how do we get away from that? Because this is a unique situation, because we're talking about, this is not just a business. We're talking about um, uh, dollars and cents and profitability and all those sorts of things. You're actually talking about, like the players have talked about, the legacy of our game, the, the rugby of the future, protecting our future. How do we get away from that and separate that in terms of understanding what's in the best interests of the whole going forward? Remembering we have... 150,000 registered rugby players in this country. What we've got to realise is that we are a professional sport and we have to support the amateur game. So the professional game is actually in pretty good shape, right? But the amateur game is not. And we really need to be careful about bringing that money in and making sure that we stay strong in the pipeline. Um, I, I got a little bit big-headed when I was a player once, and Kieran Crowley who was my roommate, said, OK, no one's bigger than the game and no one is bigger than our brand, right? So it's actually the all-black brand that's bigger than all of us. All of us sitting here that have played for that, it made it. It made us. It made me. I'm sitting here because of the power of the all-blacks worldwide. I mean, you can go tomorrow. So it's actually... We need to, we need to get the egos out of this discussion because it's not about any single person. I don't care if you're Bowden Barrett, Rob Nicholl, you know, um, I don't care who you are, John Kerwin, this is about the future of our game, so we need to get around that table again. So Mills, this, this investment going forward, does it need to support all parts of the game? The fact that from, from right from the very bottom,
right, across all of our provincial unions who have voted, remember, they have voted, they've gone and supported this deal. But let's think about it. They've obviously presented something different to the Play Association, but reality is whatever comes in, does it need to go across the entire sport? Of, of course it does, which is why it's such a big issue. The, pro the problem that we've got is that it's so broken down there that, you know, we, where do you actually start? OK, it's all right saying they've got a whole heap of money and we're going to throw it here to try and fix it, but how? Strategically, how are you actually going to fix it by just, you know, throwing money? OK, well, you know, you get rid of debt, but then how does our game grow? You know, and that's, that's been our biggest issue. You're right. Our professional, the professional side of it, we're outstanding. We're the top, top, top of the world. But how do you actually fix that? And that's where I sit. I think, well, we haven't actually implemented a plan of attack as to how that's going to happen. This is an NZR. And so when you look at it like that, it's just a whole heap of money coming in. And of course you're going to pull on those sort of, you know, heartstrings. And you know, we need money. The, the games, I mean, look, look at the, when we travelled, you know, around the clubs. How many clubs were there that were actually, that, 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 that turned up to break down on a Monday night and um, it, it was packed? There was only one. And so you, you can't tell me that, you know, you know, the club scene has changed. And so what has is, is you going to do to be able to change it? Is it too late to change? You know, can they come out now and say that? You know, because there's no use putting money across the whole game if it's not going to be fixable. And then, you, then you've got the other aspect as well. When you're looking at, at young kids register, you know, register. You know, where is that coming from? You've got mothers that don't want kids to play because of, you know, there's so many aspects in this that haven't been touched. And this is where the NZR and the, the Players Association need to go away and talk about it amongst themselves and trying to come to a solution and compromise. Where it gets former players, like for me, last week when I said about the, you know, the grab players are greedy, that's never been the case. And that's why it's, it's sort of touched the nerve with a lot of the, the players that, that um, you know, I suppose in my generation, because it's never been about greed. We're a traditional, uh, we've always been a traditional team. When I've gone overseas, the best part of, of, of being in a, in a team environment, which I've, I've grown up from, is from the club rugby scene where you've gone in there, you have a beer with your mate, you know, you, you talk about and discuss what's happened after the game. When you go overseas, everyone just goes out the door. And so we're, we're real traditional in terms of our, you know, the back seat, how we do things, the, the firm. So when you hear stuff, someone come out and say that players are greedy, I don't think that that's the case at all. And, and I support you on the fact that every player that I've spoken to, the fact, I honestly and truly believe that they do care about the game. They do care about the grassroots. They are getting closer to understanding every step they take about how important this decision is being made, and uh, but they've got someone representing them at the moment, and I think it's really, really important that their voice as a collective group is heard, and they have some sort of influence. We will see how it plays out.